a lot of my subscribers have often asked me, Vaughn, what are the lyrics to Pimp? I don't know. But some of my subscribers have said the lyrics are cold beer. Cold beer. Cold beer. Hi guys, and welcome to Piano and Keyboard Artist, where we discuss the artists related to pianos, keyboards, and synthesizers. And continuing with my Depeche Mode album review series, this is Music for the Masses, Part 5. Right, so parts 1, 2, 3, and 4, if you've not seen them yet, you can find the link in the description below and you can watch those parts before you come to this one. And in this part five, we're going to talk about the singles and the B-sides. Now this iconic album, which is a fan favorite, was released in 1987. And as you know, Depeche Mode would always release singles before an album, obviously, to promote an album. Um, and the first single they released was Strange Love, and this was released on the 13th of April, 1987. Now, what's interesting is that the single release that, that, that came out was very different to the strange love that was on the album. And Alan Wilder has spoken on interviews how he felt that that strange love uh, single, which was released preceding this album, was a little bit, little bit too cluttered as far as production is concerned. Um, the band also felt that it was a little bit too upbeat. Um, to sort of fit in with the body of work with this album. So, and if you think of it, if you think of the single of Strange Love, it's got that, it's got, well, I mean, I love it, but it's got a real sort of like poppy, upbeat feel to it. And of course, the, the version on here um, is a, a lot more, should we say, darker and downbeat. It's definitely, uh, it feels slower uh, and it just feels more grown up. Now, I believe um, Daniel Miller, uh, actually contributed, um, which became that mix on this album. So what I'm saying is, as far as I know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel Miller actually, um, you know, produced the, or mixed the version, which is on this album. So um, I only learned that pretty recently. So as I say, I, I've never heard that before, so I don't know how true it is. Um, I believe it could be true because obviously Daniel Miller, um, and Depeche Mode, obviously. But yeah, uh, the bottom line is is that the Strange Love single was a bit too sort of upbeat and poppy, and they needed something that was a little bit more uh, cohesive and would just fit in better with, you know, with the body and the context of the album. There were two B-sides on Strange Love, and they were Pimp and Agent Orange. And <laughs> I did laugh. My recent video, which I put out... Um, uh, a lot of people in the com comments below asked me, you know, what what are the lyrics to Pimp? And uh, some people said that the lyrics are cold beer. Cheers. I don't usually drink on the on the job, but um, I'm making an exception today. Cold beer, ah, cold beer. Ah. Yeah, cold beer. <laughs> I will never hear that song in the same way uh, anymore. Right, I've just got my notes here. Um, Never Let Me Down Again was released on the 24th of August, 1987, and that was the second single. Now, this was obviously the monster record on this on this album. And I mean, there are a few sort of monster uh, tracks on here. Nothing that is tremendously commercial because, you know, Depeche Mode don't play to the masses, pardon the pun. That's why I always found this title, Music for the Masses, to be quite... You know, ironic, <laughs> because they're just not a band for the masses. But Never Let Me Down Again was a real sort of, uh, it has a sort of uh, crossover type of um, vibe, that song. This is one of those songs that people who aren't Depeche Mode fans could like. Um, so the monster songs on this album are Never Let Me Down Again, Strange Love, uh, Behind the Wheel. Um, yeah, I'd say those three are the real sort of like the ones that were could possibly be well not commercial but the that could possibly win people over in the commercial field 
Now, I showed you guys last week, I actually have this Never Let Me Down Again uh, split mix, and it's on an interesting orange vinyl. Check that out. Orange vinyl. I love that. Orange is the color of uh, creativity. Um, and apparently, purple is the color of sexual frustration. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. The B-sides to Never Let Me Down Again were Pleasure Little Treasure and To Have and To Hold, The Spanish Taster. Now, um, Pleasure Little Treasure. Pleasure Little Treasure! When it gets to the end, it's got that, huh? I, I, I think, is it the glitter mix? I'm not a big fan of the song, guys. Um, I know this is one of Alan Wilder's most loathed tracks. He really didn't like this song. Um, but I think it's, is it the glitter mix? It's the one that ends. He, han, ha, su, he, tu, han, a, ki. It's got that weird sort of like, it sounds like strange, like chants. What's interesting is I'm going to send a special shout out to... Heiko Brun, one of my uh, subscribers and Facebook group members, he actually sent me a video where he actually figured out how they did the ending of that song. Now, I'm going to place a link in the description below. Watch that video. Heiko, that was brilliant. Um, okay, a little spoiler. What Heiko actually demonstrates in this video is that the ending of Pleasure Little Treasure, that part where it goes, he, han, a, su, ki, you know, that strange, strange ending. It is actually, you, they, they produce that using elements of uh, the grabbing hands, everything counts in large amounts. They actually reversed that and, you know, manipulated it and chopped it up. And anyway, watch this video clip with Heiko uh, Brun. Uh, Heiko, you are my kind of geek, brother. Seriously, you are so welcome on this channel. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know where you get the time to do this, but I really appreciate this. Guys, check out that video. It's really, really fascinating. The second B-side is To Have and To Hold, which which they called the Spanish taster. Dum, 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 dum. Now, apparently, Alan Wilder, mentioned uh, in an interview I read somewhere that this song really sort of demonstrates the difference between his taste and Martin's taste because Martin wanted this version to go onto the album. I believe that is the version he wants to go onto the album, apparently. Um, but I think Alan Wilder got his way. And instead of getting this version, we got the version of To Have and To Hold which we know on the Music for the Masses album. And that version, I need to be cleansed, it's time to make amends. It's really, that is the darkest track on this album. And as Alan mentioned in an interview, that is a perfect example of how Alan's taste and Martin's taste were so different. Think of it, to have and to hold on the Music for the Masses album, or to having to hold the Spanish taster. Dun, 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 dun. And you can actually see the difference between Martin and Alan's taste. It's really, really highlighted in this. Um, I like both versions. I suppose um, most people would probably prefer the Spanish taster. Dun, 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 dun. It's got more of a kind of like a groove. It's more melodic. Whereas the, uh, the version we got on the Music for the Masses album, the, the to having to hold, uh, which was Alan's favorite one, is typical recoil type stuff. It's, you know, it's very dark, very atmospheric, and very creepy. Um, very interesting. So um, I don't, I've not heard the demo of uh, To Have and To Hold, so I, I, I'm, I'm thinking uh, the demo probably had that dum 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 And then, of course, Alan interpreting Martin's demos would change them a lot. So the way I see it is Alan Wilder got his way. Um, by putting the version of To Have and To Hold that he liked 
and having that released on the Music for the Masses album, the compromise was, okay, Martin, we can release your version, but we will release it as a B-side. And as a result, uh, To Heaven to Hold, the Spanish Taster was released as a B-side. Right, and before we continue, there is no sponsor for this video, but I would like to bring your attention to the Depeche Mode artwork, which can be purchased on this channel. These are the original album covers as produced by photographer Brian Griffin. As you guys know, Brian is a regular uh, guest on this channel. And this artwork, which he has made exclusively available to the Vaughan George channel, is a collection of iconic images from the Depeche Mode albums, which he did. Now, all these poster prints are 31 by 31 centimeters squared. And they are printed on premium 300 GSM quality paper. And these are the most honest reproductions of Brian Griffin's work anywhere to be found in the world. What makes this offer unique is that this is the only YouTube channel in the world where you can purchase the original Depeche Mode uh, artwork, which was produced by Brian Griffin. And these are, as I say, derived from the original uh, transparencies and negatives. And this is one that I'm particularly proud of, um, which Brian has made uh, available to the channel. Um, when, he, when I said I want Black Celebration, um, but I want it the way no one's ever seen it before, um, he presented uh, me with this black and white version of Black Celebration. And um, I said I want it with a jet black border. And as you can see, this one has been autographed by Brian. And uh, all the poster prints which are purchased here through the Vaughan George channel um, are personally autographed by Brian Griffin himself. And you can get full information to that on vaughangeorge.com slash shop. Right, and that brings us on to the third single which was released on the 28th of December 1987. And that was Behind the Wheel. Now, <sighs> looking through Depeche Mode's catalogue, depending on what country you are in, there are so many different versions and variations. I know I grew up in South Africa and, you know, the versions we got and even like the track listing on some albums um, was slightly different. Okay, on the albums it was always the same, but you know, if, if you bought Depeche Mode on a CD, obviously a CD can take more songs. Sometimes there were like extended versions and, you know, the the, 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 the track listing was slightly different. So um, I cannot possibly do a video on every single combination, but I can tell you that um, Behind the Wheel, um, the, the B side to Behind the Wheel was Route 66. And as I say, there are different versions of these singles, different incarnations. Uh, you know, they are they were like the 12 inch versions. They were the seven inch versions. But all you need to know from this is, is that the B side to Behind the Wheel is Route 66. But at this time, Depeche Mode were to me one of the bands, one of the acts that really put the emphasis on the B sides. Uh, the extended versions, the remixes. And I think this is really down to Daniel Miller, as I will discuss in my Mute Mute Records special I'm going to bring out later. Um, I really think it was Daniel Miller who really decided to package and produce and promote uh, their B-sides and their alternative versions in a way that was more aggressive and definitely more creative than any other band. I mean, other bands, of course, and other artists around that time did release B-sides and, you know, remixes and all. But Depeche Mode just really did it in a way that I think was head and shoulders above everyone else. And, of course, that is something that they don't, haven't really seemed to have majored on on the last few albums. Of course, with the last few albums, they have been singles and you know, releases, uh, you know, extended releases and remixes. But I'm talking of the sort of the heyday, sort of like from, I don't know, the first up until, let's say, Violator, up until Music for the Masses, especially in the sort of, like in the, in the 80s, they really, Depeche Mode really were the band that just did remixes and special editions and B-sides better than any other band I could think of at, at the time. The fourth and final single, which was released on the 16th of May, 1988, was Little 15. And the B-side to Little 15 uh, is an instrumental piano, beautifully dark. Oh, it's, it's just such a filmic, epic song. Um, and the title to that is a Swedish word, which means star. And it's written as Stjarna, but apparently it's pronounced, help me, uh, Schwerner. 
Schwen. My Swedish friends, help me, please. I I'm trying. Um, yeah, I really, really like that track. And I, I really like the, the, the whole Music for the Masses um, album. If you look at the one before it, if we, if we take from Black Celebration, um, you know, it had a sound. And of course, every Depeche Mode album has a sound. But this, they really incorporated sort of like really big orchestral uh, layers into this and and it really went it really went filmic and epic at this point and I really think this was down to Alan's musical training and and classical background that really shone through in this um, album and this indeed this body of work now I do remember hearing a piano piece of Alan Wilder playing Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata now I don't know which single that was on um, please in the description below guys contribute and let me know um, but once again, you know, this this depends on which country you were you were you are in. I I I'm trying to make this as detailed as possible, but as I say, it is impossible for me to, um, because each country had different interpretations on it, which I find very strange. And you know, this this is all down to licensing and regions and uh, subjects which are really too complicated and boring for this video. But yeah, I um I I do as I say, I did like this sort of kind of very musical, very classical kind of approach that was pushed through in this album. Uh, very, very, very sort of classical, very, very musical and, and, and epic. Right, and that concludes the singles for this stunning album. Um, guys, part six and the final part to this Music for the Masses will be out next week. And in that part, I will run through the remaining songs. I will also do piano improvisations at the end. And then I'm going to wrap it up with a mark out of 10. We're going to score it. And that's going to conclude a very, very exciting, a very fun-filled uh, album review on Music for the Masses. I'm thinking of when we started early in the year, we went to interview Dave Bascombe, my, you know, Lloyd and Simon and I on the road. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, gets quite emotional. If this is your first time to my channel, I would like to welcome you with open arms. Hit that subscribe button, uh, give us a like, leave a comment and join the community. I am also on Facebook. The Facebook group is there especially for us to discuss the content on this video and go into more detail. Uh, jump in, join the Facebook group. I'm also on Twitter. I'm also on Instagram. And I would like to thank my loyal patron supporters for all your support as always. Guys, thank you so much as always. I really appreciate your support. And I look forward to seeing you when we discuss part six, the concluding chapter in Music for the Masses. Take care. Adios.